everyone. Nice to, be, nice to be here with you. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, uh, it's nice to be here. Uh, my, my name's Dennis Odo, and I'm going to be talking to you about uh, some thoughts on how we can foster the development of digital literacy skills uh, in our EFL classrooms. This is a little kind of tour of what's to come. Uh, we'll start off with a little bit of background and talking a bit about some of the issues that we want to keep in mind related to um, teaching di digital literacies. From there, we'll talk a bit about um, digital literacies specific to English language teaching, so, so kind of narrow it a bit. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the affordances and the constraints. And so uh, this morning, uh, Daniel Svoboda talked a bit about some of the the pros and the cons, the benefits and the drawbacks, and so I'm going to come back in on that a little bit here uh, as well. And finally, I'll finish up uh, by talking about some specific ideas for how we can use digital literacies in the classroom, um, and I'll go over some examples of digital literacy tools with you all. So in terms of background, um, I think we'd all, probably most of us here would acknowledge that English is the world's second language, sorry Esperanto, um, at least for the time being, right? Uh, we don't know how things are gonna turn out, but for the time being, uh, English is the world's second language. Um, and so if we want our uh, learners to get access to the broader global world, right, and many of the, the benefits that it brings with it, with it um, we want them to be competent English uh, users. So English and digital literacy are the keys that offer our students to, uh, access to the, to the globe, to the world, right? Um, they are both, we, we need both. We can't have one without the other. Having English ability by itself isn't quite enough. We also need skills um, for navigating uh, the, the, the internet and digital tools. So English provides us with access to science, technology, business content, and entertainment from around the world. Um, and it lets us learn from those resources, not just as uh, people, but also as language learners, so we can benefit in both ways. But we have to also be mindful, like we all, like as, as uh, Daniel mentioned this morning, uh, we have to be mindful that, they, of course, these tools come with a lot of benefits, but they also uh, come with some uh, potential pitfalls that we also have to be aware of. Um, so we have to make sure that we're mindful of these pitfalls and give digital literacy the attention that it deserves. Um, some advances in digital literacy communication technologies have led to important changes in the way people read, think, and communicate, right? If we think about print, print is a technology. We don't think about that because it's so common and ubiquitous in our everyday life. It is a type of technology. But, and so but when we think about digital literacies, digital literacies are like a type of technology added on to print literacy that pre presents even more complexity that we have to deal with. Um, mo most new forms of representation in digital text are increasingly hypertextual, multimodal, interactive, and plurilingual, right? So not just, if we think about traditional literacy, on top of that, we're adding we're adding hypertext. So now within a text, I can click on a link and go to a totally new text, right? And that shapes the way that I read the text now. Um, they're multimodal, right? And so if, if we think of multimodal text, a traditional literate text that we read was just the print. But now we have print, we have visuals, we have sound, we have tactile. And all of these things come with new layers of meaning. That's the thing, right? It's, when seeing the visuals sometimes contrast, the creator of the te text wants to contrast the visuals with the print, right? And so we need to see that meaning. We need to uh, make that meaning ourselves. And so we have to prepare our students to be able to do that. Um, so because of these issues, the curriculum itself needs to be rethought and uh, digital literacies need to be kind of integrated into the curriculum at a deep level. Um, English language teachers are, English language learners are tasked with understanding ta texts online, um, and now they don't just decode the text. That's what I mentioned earlier with a multimodal uh, text. When we read a text, we read, the, we read the words on the page, and that's kind of where the information's coming. But when we're interacting with a multimodal text, the information isn't only coming from the words, the information is coming from the sounds, it's coming from the visuals, it's coming from all other 
modes within that text that our students have to understand how to uh, read, as it were, or how to make sense of. Um, yeah, these texts go beyond writing, and they draw on the unique digital affordances of all the things I mentioned, uh, hypertext, multimodality, and interactivity. Another thing I'll, I'll touch on uh, is this, this idea of uh, critical thinking, and critical thinking is a key component to digital literacy, right? The idea that we, in the past, we, we got information that was kind of approved information. If a book was published, it was vetted, it was, it was checked already, but now we just get the information directly ourselves. We have to decide what's good information and what's less trustworthy information. Now the, the onus is on us to have the critical thinking to, to decide um, the value of text that we deal with. So digital communication tools are everywhere. These tools have changed the nature of language and communication. And we have to, to participate in the global world. Uh, we now have to master these tools. Learners also have more opportunities to communicate online. Um, online spaces, and the, the, the beauty of it is, is online spaces offer students abilities to communicate, and they, offer, they also offer students access to the world, and a world of content that's tailored, potentially tailored to their exact needs or their exact desires, whatever it is that they want to learn about, they have the potential to access it, right? If they have the skills to be able to sort between the good content or the problematic content uh, and the, the more valid content, if they have the skills that they need. Um, they don't often use digital, but the, the thing is, as teachers, and I'll come back to this point in a few minutes, as teachers, we often are a little bit reticent to uh, expose students to more digital technology uh, because we think we, we kind of have the idea, well, they already know it, and often my students know the technology better than I know the technology, right? We kind of have this idea ourselves that they might know it better than we do. Um, but that might... There's a kind of myth built in there. There's this idea that we think that they know better than they do. And a lot of the key skills that they need to be able to n navigate this technology, they actually don't have. Just because a child can play with a, an iPad doesn't mean that they're a critical consumer of the information on that iPad. And as a teacher, that's what we can help them, is to become more critical consumers um, of the information that they have, have access to. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about some definitions, briefly, uh, for digital literacy. Now, the thing about digital literacy is there's actually a few different ways of looking at it. It's not, it's kind of a group of overlapping concepts. You could see it this way. Different thinkers and different researchers kind of have different ideas about what it is, right? So some call it new literacies. Others have referred to it as multi-literacies, uh, multi-modality, uh, multi-modal literacies, or even electronic literacies. And again, this is kind of a cluster of concepts that relate to digital literacies. Some definitions of digital literacies. Um, th these practices, of, they are the practices of communicating, uh, relating, thinking, and being associated with digital media. So it's being able to be an effective uh, user of digital media. Uh, digital literacy defines, a second definition here, digital literacy defines those capabilities which fit an individual for living, learning, working in a digital society. So it's being a competent participant in uh, a digital society. And then the last definition, uh, information literacy is a set of skills and knowledge that allows us to find, evaluate, and use the information we need, as well as filter out the information that we don't need, right? And again, it comes back to that idea of using our uh, critical thinking skills to filter out uh, potentially problematic information. What are the, uh, some of the specific components? We're able to, if we see at the top there, we're able to uh, comprehend multimodal tac uh, texts. So for example, a, a multimodal text that I think represents pretty well would be a video game, right? When you play a video game, you're seeing it, sounds, pictures, moving pictures, text, all of these elements, even the controllers that rumble, all of these elements have different meaning, right? And we have to put this meaning together to make sense of that text. 
Um, and that's the idea of comprehending a multimodal text. We also need research information, uh, research and information literacy. So when we talk about this idea of uh, the post-truth era, right, or, or questionable content online, as a consumer of information, I need to be able to go out, take information from different sources, synthesize that information in a way that makes sense to me, right? And again, while I'm synthesizing and bringing together that information to learn about a topic, at the same time, I have to decide what's good information and what's uh, questionable information. And so that's the research information fluency. Critical thinking, problem solving, as I mentioned, we, that's the, the sifting process, sorting between the good and the bad information. Um, communicating, going online, being able to collaborate with people from around the world. And then, of course, uh, composing. So not only um, do we want our students to be able to consume multimodal texts, right? We also want them to be able to produce them and send them out in the, into the world to make their own statements, right? About uh, issues that they care about, for example. So the, what's the role of the teacher and the student here? Um, the teacher, I think, we have to move a little bit from our traditional role of being, you know, we all know the sage on the stage. We have to kind of move away from that role a little bit to being the guide at the side. So now the student is in the, the driver's seat. The student is working with the technologies and then we're helping the students. We're at their side, giving them information to help them more, uh, be more critical users of the the tools themselves or the information that they get in the tools. Uh, yeah, digital literacy or technology won't replace teachers. That's the thing. I think a lot of teachers, we, we might worry, is technology going to replace me at some point? And I don't think that'll be the case. I think what'll actually happen is the teachers who are more uh, willing to try or use technology more, those are the teachers who might be the, te the ones who replace those who are less uh, willing to um, work with and try new technologies. Um, digital technologies, of course, they come with a lot, they give us a lot, uh, and I, I'll show you a video a little bit later on of a technology, a tool where you can actually take a virtual tour. You can go to any place in the world, and any famous site in the world, and take a virtual tour of that site, of the Eiffel Tower, for example. So, I mean, we can really give our students, using these tools, we can give them three, a 3D experience of the world around them, right, that they might not otherwise have. Students themselves, their role shifts now, as I mentioned, they're more, uh, their learning is more self-directed. They have the chance to work themselves, do the work themselves with the input uh, with, uh, from the teacher who uh, acts as a resource. Um, okay, so one thing I, I do want to mention too is this, I, I think I touched on it earlier, is this notion of the, the myth of the digital native. I think that's a big thing we have to be careful of. Students in some, are younger people in some sense, they are like competent users with these tools or, or they at least appear to be competent users with these tools, but at the same time there's certain skills and certain uh, types of literacy that we have that they don't have that we have to impart to them, right, to make them more uh, con critical consumers of the information that they have with these tools. Um, so uh, just before I kind of shift gears into the next part, I want you guys to take a second and just maybe talk to the person next to you and think about if you were going to start a class blog in your own class, what do you think might be two or three things that you would worry about? Two or three things that you think, uh, this could be a problem. But then also at the same time, what do you think might be two or three things that might be a benefit of doing something like that? All right, if you're going to start a class blog, how could your students benefit from it in some way? So just maybe turn to the person next to you for a sec and go ahead and share a couple ideas. Go ahead, I'll give you maybe two minutes.
Okay, I'll just interrupt you there if you don't mind. Um, anybody willing to share what do you think might be a benefit from do it using a class blog? Anybody want to share a potential benefit? No benefits to a class blog? <laughs> no? There's nothing? You can't think of a single, single thing right here? Okay, so they get a chance to show what they're learning, maybe even to a global audience, right? Or to a wide audience, uh, an authentic audience. And yeah, that's a, I think that's a big benefit of a, of a class blog. Um, can anybody think of what might be a drawback to using a class blog? Uh, okay, so it could, could be kind of like, it could become, well, I'll, maybe I'll say it this way, the information could be shared maybe with people that the, the class themselves don't want it to be shared with, right? Or it could be kind of a, become kind of an assessment tool in some sense, right? Yeah, and so again, there's, it, it comes with these, these potential benefits and uh, possible drawbacks at the same time. So uh, th that kind of leads me into the next topic I want to talk about is this, this notion of affordances and constraints. And affordances and constraints relates to benefits and drawbacks, but it's a little bit um, different at the same time. So rather, we have to think, when we think about using certain tools, we often think, oh, I want to get this tool, I want to get this tool, this looks good, like this new shiny new thing, I want to get this, it looks good, right? But sometimes we have to step back and think, when I use this tool, what do I get from it? Or how, how can using this tool be beneficial for my learners versus what are some potential downsides? We often think about the positives, but we sometimes think less about what might be some downsides, like sharing work, my work with an audience that I don't necessarily want to share it with. Right? Um, so digital tools can affect reading, writing, communicating, because they have different uh, affordances and constraints. Different users see different affordances and different constraints. You and I might look at the same tool, the same technology tool, and you might think, oh, this is going to be great. I can use it for this and this and this. And I might look and think, oh, no, I don't like that. I don't like how it's going to expose my information to people that I don't want to see it. Right? So we need to think about that. When we think about using the tools, is it just, is it going to be beneficial? How is it going to benefit uh, students? And then how the most, as many students as possible, right? So we have to be aware of both. Um, if I give you an example, would be this microphone. So we think of, oh, microphone's great, because a microphone allows me to share my voice with a wide group of people. And so that's a, a affordance that it gives me. But at the same time, a constraint that it gives me is that I can't now talk privately with one individual if I want to, right? And get private feedback from one individual. So again, we get both. We get, they, it comes with the good, it comes with the bad, and it, it's tied to my purpose for using it, right? If, I, if, I, if, if my purpose is to get feedback from an individual, this tool isn't going to help me very much, right? Okay, um, so it, now if, just in terms of some general affordances, what do we get from using digital literacy tools in general? So specific tools will have different affordances and constraints, but if we think in terms of general, what do we get uh, overall? Well, digital tools give us access to a large amount of information. We know all that. We go online. The world's library is at our fingertips, right? Um, they give us multiple reading paths. The second point there, hypertexts. So unlike traditional texts now, as a second language reader, I can often click on the word and get the definition for it, right? Or I can get, I can get multimodal, multimodal, multimedia information about the text that I'm reading just by clicking on words in it. So that's a, a big uh, affordance that it gives me. I can, follow the, I can go through a text, unlike in the traditional linear path, I can go in different directions as I'm reading the same text. Um, it combines speech, writing, sound, and images. And so again, all of, that's a multimodal text. And I can get different information pathways can give me more help, more scaffolding in understanding a text, for example. And then it allows one-to-many interactions. If I, have, if I have a message that I want to send with the world, I now have a platform to do it. Like, think of this. Think of people around the world who, children around the world, who share their voice through an online platform, and now people are taking their voice seriously, right? Um, so it really opens up an, an avenue to communicate with the world that we haven't uh, previously had. But comes with these constraints, right? Um, 
one, one issue that we don't often think about and people don't often touch, touch on is the idea that access to information can shape our values, can shape our worldview in new ways, right? That can often be productive, that can be a good thing to shape our worldview, but sometimes it can be, a little tr it can be also problematic when our new worldview no longer matches the worldview of our community, right? And so this is an issue that we can, we can run into just by getting access to this information. Again, we, we, in consuming this information, it draws on higher order thinking skills that we don't often have, right? When we think of fake news, when people read fake news, they consume fake news, they don't know it's fake news. That's the problem, right? And so we, we need those critical thinking skills in order to be able to um, consume this information and understand what's reliable, what's not. The other issue is, when we think about it, we know this, we've done this ourselves, if you look at your YouTube feed, look at that little scroll down the side of your, your YouTube channel, right? Those are all videos that are suggested to you by YouTube. And so it, you know, there's this notion that it creates what's called a filter bubble, or an echo chamber, and a filter bubble is this notion that, let's say I'm a moderately conservative person, I'm moderately conservative, but I go online and I start watching conservative videos and they start, it, the algorithm starts suggesting even more conservative videos and so it can push me farther and farther into an extreme position than I might otherwise be in. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so again, some of the constraints that we face that we might not um, at first blush uh, think about. So c considering these things, uh, what are some things that we can do to actually bring these technologies into our classroom. I'm going to talk to you about four activities ideas and then I'll show you some uh, examples of tools that I think are pretty good tools. So the first one's uh, structured participation, then we'll talk about embedding in the curriculum, then from there uh, multimodal composing products, projects, and then virtual exchange. So the first one's this idea where we said students have to be in the driver's seat to begin with. And so we start with what the students are doing. We can ask them, what, what kind of texts are you using? Like, what kind of video games are you playing these days, right? A lot, of our, a lot of our kids, I know myself, if I think of my nephew, my Canadian nephew, he's on playing these uh, video games with people from around the world. So there are other kids who are talking to him in English from other countries, and they're playing these video games, right? I'm pretty sure you, you know a lot of kids are doing the same thing. Well, you can start with a text that's an example. You can start with a text like that, you can bring the text into the classroom, and you can analyze it, and you can, you can look at the text as a genre. So for example, if you look at a video game, the chat in a video game, when you're chatting with someone else, what's a polite way to interrupt? What's a polite way to disagree with someone and make your point, right? And talk about the kind of language that you use. Trust me, they're going to be very interested in that. Right? I know myself, I, I, remember, I remember I came to Korea, initially I came to Korea a long time ago. I came in Korea when Warcraft, uh, Starcraft was big, right? And what's the things, we, they, I, you know, I was teaching elementary and then the kids would come to my class, go, go, go! And they knew all the phrases, all the language from the, the video game, right? Well, now video games, it's not just the language of the game itself, it's the language of other users in the game. And so we can draw on that language and we can help them because they want to use it. This is language they actually want to be able to produce themselves, right? And I'm not saying this has to become the whole curriculum, but if we can carve out that space to let them work with the kind of genre that they're actually interested in, um, it's something to consider. So as I mentioned, uh, uh, we can go over the text features, talk to them about the text features. How can we do this better? What's a more appropriate way to interrupt uh, somebody or, or to... Uh, take a turn when you're, you're trying to uh, communicate. Um, so the teachers can in, encourage the students then, after you've gone over some of the video games or, or whatever the text is that you're using, uh, you can go back and get, give students a chance to try them out, try out the new language that they're using. Uh, another one is uh, uh, process-oriented genre approach, the second one I want to mention. This one comes from the idea that often as teachers, one reason why we don't want to use digital tools is that the curriculum's full enough as it is. Like, I'm busy enough as it is just trying to get through my regular curriculum. So how can I put this on top? Where does it fit? How can I fit it into the curriculum? And so then we can ask, well, 
we can use the tools to interact with the content itself, right? So we can use the tools to work with the content. I'll try to give you an example to see if it helps. Um, so we can identify, for example, some text genres or text practices, a kind of text that we're teaching or that we're using in the class, like maybe writing a letter to a friend. Um, and then we could see if we can do kind of an online version of this. And then we can, re we can reflect on what kind of tools can be used to explore this genre. So whatever text it is that I'm, that's part of the curriculum that I'm using, what kind of digital tool could I use to produce this text? And then we can design projects, tasks, or materials um, that allow students to explore the genres through these tools. For example, um, if we can get students maybe to create a poster or a web page or a, a PowerPoint, of course, digital stories, anything that we can come up with that would be a good way to represent the content that we're trying to teach them or uh, use the language that we're trying to teach them. So creating these kinds of multimodal texts can help students see the affordances as they're trying to create, for example, an audio essay or create a PowerPoint, they can start to think, and with our help, what's good about this? What's, what's uh, challenging about it? Okay, another idea is um, telecollaboration uh, or using a virtual exchange uh, project. So telecollaboration, uh, an example of this would be connecting uh, Korean students and US students and getting them to work together to do some kind of online text. So they could work together to produce uh, a web page maybe or a documentary or something like that, uh, some kind of web uh, online text, like the, mentioned in the previous ones, poster maybe, uh, audio essay, digital story. Um, and then from there, another idea would be they could do parallel texts. So you could have a Korean translation of the text that maybe the US students would read, you can have an English translation of the same text, and then the Korean students could, tr could scaffold the US students to understand the Korean text. The US students could scaffold the Korean students to understand the English text, right? So again, they can kind of be teachers and learners to each other, helping each other um, understand the text. Another idea related to telecollaboration would be ethnographic interviews. So um, for example, having middle school students interview other middle school students about what it's like to be a middle school student in the US or what it's like to be a middle school student uh, in Korea. Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to do, so these are some ideas, four ideas for how we could uh, integrate digital literacies into our classes. But now I want to show you some examples of tools. Uh, I'm going to show you these tools by showing you kind of little introductions to the tools, right? So as you're watching the introductions, I'll go through the introductions with you. As you're watching them, just it may be in your book there, I think on the next page of your book, you'll see this. Take note of one that you like, one or two that you like, and how might you be able to use this in your own class? As you see how it's being used, how might you be able to use it um, in your own class? So let's see here. Okay, here's the first one. So, so again, if you like it, how might you use it? Someone asked you what is a bear. Where would you begin? Go back to the beginning. Okay. If someone asked you what is a bear, where would you begin? Perhaps you could use Wikipedia to describe where bears live and what they eat. Or maybe you could use Google Images to show what different types of bears look like, or YouTube videos to show bears interacting in their natural habitats. The internet is full of useful resources, not to mention your own text, pictures, sounds, and videos. But what if you could have all this content in one place? With a glog, that's exactly what you get. With thousands of glogs categorized by subject and endless ways of expressing ideas, the Glogpedia library makes it easier to find exactly what you're looking for. Our structured and approved digital content for learners allows anyone to find and share information in our library, as well as get inspiration for creating new glogs. Why wait? Start glogging. Okay, so that's the first one is Glogster. Uh, the next one, just a sec here. Where are we? Okay, great big story. We believe that there is still wonder in the world. 
So we're on a mission to open your eyes to places and people you've never known. Our stories transcend borders and are created by global storytellers and renowned brands. When you look around you, it's incredible. Let's uncover the... Okay. Next. ...having fun and bringing presentations to life. Let's dive in. Still back to the beginning there. ...is all about making learning fun and bringing presentations to life. Let's dive into the creation canvas where you can add all types of elements, like pre-made backgrounds, you can add animations to make your project dynamic and fun. And a wide variety of images from the Buncee Library. You can always choose to upload images of your own too. Once added, resize and move those objects to your liking. Rotate with ease. Group objects to make designing easier. Search for and insert videos without leaving Buncee. And even draw freehand with your mouse or touch screen. Choose from a large library of fonts when adding text. And even add a QR code to your creation with just the click of a button. Bring your Buncee creation to life by recording a video of your own using your webcam. It really couldn't be easier. Share your finalized project by grabbing a link or sending through email. Share to social media too to reach a global audience. With Buncee, you are free to let your imagination run wild. Okay. Next. I've got two more I want to show you. An award winning EdTech tool trusted by millions of teachers and used by tens of thousands of schools and districts. Nearpod is a platform that easily allows teachers to create, download, and teach interactive lessons across all student devices, including Chromebooks, iPads, iPhones, and Android devices, and works on any operating system or browser. Nearpod works seamlessly with Google Classroom and integrates with learning management systems like Canvas and Schoology. Teachers can easily upload their existing PowerPoints, PDFs, Google Slides, and sways and convert them into interactive Nearpod lessons by including engaging activities like quizzes, polls, draw it, open-ended questions, fill in the blanks, and 3D objects. And with Nearpod VR, teachers can take their students on a virtual field trip anywhere in the world. Nearpod VR works on any device with or without headsets. Imagine taking students to the Taj Mahal, the Pyramids of Giza, the Washington Monument, or the Great Wall of China, all from the comfort of your classroom. Teachers launch a live lesson, students enter a lesson code, and the lesson is synced to all student devices. Teachers can also launch student-paced lessons, which allow students to complete a lesson on their own time wherever they are. Teachers get real-time feedback on student understanding and can access post-lesson reports to assess individual and class performance. Nearpod also has a library of thousands of ready-to-teach, standards-aligned K-12 lessons across all subjects. Okay, I think that's a good introduction. I have one more I want to show here. Great, amazing video. Do you want to create amazing video lessons in minutes? Edpuzzle is your missing piece. In Edpuzzle, you can find wonderful educational videos from YouTube, LearnZillion, Khan Academy, Vimeo, or even reuse video lessons from other teachers or upload your own. Then you can make the perfect lesson using 
add puzzle editing tool. You can trim a video and take only what you need for your lesson. You can also record your voice to make a warm introduction or explain with your own words. Finally, you can embed questions during the video to check the understanding of your students. In minutes, you created the perfect lesson and in just one click you can assign it to your students. Edpuzzle provides you all the information you need. Who hasn't watched the video? Who doesn't understand the lesson? And who did a good job? Remember, in Edpuzzle you can find amazing educational videos. Make the perfect lesson in minutes and track your students with hassle-free analytics. Okay, so um, I've just introduced you to a few examples of uh, digital tools that you might be interested in learning more about, but I hope you'll take a, a minute now and uh, maybe take a minute or two, talk to the person next to you again, and tell them what might be one or two of these tools that you think might be useful and how might you use it yourself. Um, so yeah, go ahead and share it with the person next to you for a minute. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, so I hope I, I think you've seen at least one or two tools there that might have potential for you. Um, I'm just going to wrap up. I think I've got a minute or two left. Um, so just in the time we've been here, we've talked a bit about uh, some of the background and de definitions related to digital liter literacies. Uh, we've talked about digital literacies in language teaching, some of the affordances and constraints that they give us as teachers, and then some suggestions for how we might integrate them into to our classes and some potential tools that you might be interested in. So I'm going to wrap up there, say thank you very much for your time, and enjoy the rest of your day.